Before I begin, I, I'd like to have a moment of silence for the passing of Donald J. Kirkman Dio, who was acting as our consultant. He passed away uh, January 4th, 2018, and a little bit later in the program we'll have a video presentation. Thank you very much. This time I'd like to begin with agenda item one, which is a uh, call to order and roll call. Mm -hmm. Megan Blair. Megan Blair. Present. Dr. Buhari. Present. Andrew Marino. Present. Dr. Lolly. Present. Claudia Mercado. Present. Dr. Zamuda. Present. Thank you. Oh, uh, Megan, can you verify mm -hmm. your address and? Uh, let us know if there's any uh, public members there. I am located at the San Diego Central Library at 330 Park Boulevard on the fifth floor. Um, and there are no members of public present. Uh, can you give us the conference room number, please? The, uh, Conference room number is 443. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, public comments for items not on the agenda. Uh, thank you very much. Our next item will be out of order. We have a guest with us today, the <coughs> Director of uh, Consumer Affairs, Mr. Dean Rothwell. Or Felix, excuse me. I'm cousin Nick Ruffalo, so <laughs> maybe, maybe we're late. Dr. Zimuto, Dr. Lolly, Executive Officer Burton, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to address this board. First of all, Happy New Year. And I <clears throat> apologize, it's taken me nearly 10 minutes to finally directly address this board. Um, as you folks already would know, with the breadth of depth of DCA. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to be in multiple places simultaneously. Hopefully, as uh, I continue in this role, I get better at doing that. Uh, nonetheless, um, again, glad to be here to briefly provide a, uh, a, a department update. specific to justice and fairness, and uh, looking forward to identifying specific ways in which I'm going to be able to hopefully work directly uh, with all of you. I know I'm able to do that indirectly uh, via the board, but um, in my ex past experiences in the, in the legislature elsewhere, um, in my view, <clears throat> in order to truly tackle you know, the complexities of any issue, obviously specific to uh, this issue related to the board, I think that the most effective way to do that is to try to proactively and affirmatively identify ways that we can work directly, and so I'm um, hoping to do that uh, sooner than later. As you folks are very well aware, there's been some new additions to the TCA senior exec team that has been reported pre previously. I'm confident that those staff additions are going to be able to strengthen our ability to pursue the department's mission and the services that we provide to our various boards and, and, and bureaus. Moving on specific to the next item I wanted to share with you specific to the upcoming director's meeting. Uh, this month on the 29th of January, the department will hold its director, director's meeting, board executive officers and board presidents. These quarterly meetings are an opportunity to ensure that I'm available to hear important issues facing not only this board, but uh, all the others and all the and others as well. <clears throat> Specific to the upcoming Executive Brown Bag Gathering, the department is also hosting an Executive Brown Bag Gathering on the 28th 
It's organized by our solid team. These brown bags are a series of structured social gatherings that provide a forum for transferring knowledge, building trust, and establishing network relationships among board EOs, bureau chiefs, and TCA executives. The next gathering will cover various topics such as developing and maintaining employee engagement in organizations. Uh, at this moment, I'm going to hand it over to Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services, Christopher Castillo. <coughs> Thanks, Dean, and hello, everybody. Pleasure to see you all again. Um, be very quick, just a brief reminder on uh, one of our favorite topics, required board member trainings. We've uh, finally come up with the dates for the 2018 board member orientation training, so I wanted to go ahead and provide those to you um, here today. The first one's going to be on March 21st, and um, the second to the next three will be June 6th, September 18th, and December 5th. We'll also email those out. Uh, to your executive officer um, to make sure they're available to you. As a reminder, um, the board member orientation training is a required training for uh, any new board member or reappointment to a board within your first year. Um, just want to say, take a moment and let you all know I appreciate working with the board on all the required trainings um, that are, are required and working with um, your executive officer on uh, making sure that we have all the necessary documentation that um, all those, rec those required trainings uh, are in order. As always, if you have any questions about any of the required trainings, any um, other ways that the Office of Board and Bureau Services can be of service to you, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself um, or either of our assistant deputies, Ms. Karen Nelson and Mr. Patrick Lee. And again, it's a pleasure to be able to be in front of you here again today. Thank you. I know, there's a, I know there's a busy agenda for you folks. Don't want to get in the way of that. I'm happy to. Uh, answer any questions you need to right. I have uh, two uh, items of uh, concern in terms of things that we need to uh, address ongoing. Uh, one, of course, is the fact uh, of our financial stability and an awareness of where we are fiscally. And as you're probably aware, um, computers are good when they're working and computers aren't very good when they're not working. And so, unfortunately, there's been uh, some delay in recouping the, uh, the fiscal data information, uh, which uh, makes our budgeting uh, difficult in terms of knowing where, where we are today. I, I liken it to knowing my bank account. And my wife says, well, we've got plenty of checks. And I said, well, we really need to know what the balance in the bank is so we know whether we can write checks or not. So one of the things that we, we hopefully get some resolution in the near future, of course, is having an up-to-date uh, um, acknowledgement of where we are today so that we can know who we are in fiscal. I, I know we have some performance and things we're going to talk about later, but I think that actual numbering will be important to us. Uh, the second issue is, is something that uh, every department deals with, and it has to do with uh, budget change proposals. As we know, we set up a budget, we're working with that budget, and sometimes we have to request uh, changes to that. Again, that goes back to the first item, which is knowing where we are fiscally. And the next is, well, where do we need to go to achieve certain things? But one of the problems that we've encountered in the past is getting the feedback as to why the budget change proposals are not accepted. Just the non acceptance is doesn't tell us anything fiscally or formal wise. So hopefully in the future what we can have back from the is to say uh, based upon what variables or factors so that we need to know what we have to do to, to make things work. And it's just it just allows us to then balance those two things out. But you can handle it together. Appreciate bringing those two items to my attention. Uh, for the first item, <clears throat> specific to having a better understanding of you know, the current day real-time um, budget status of the board. Um, I think there are, there are currently, I think there are ways that we can, we can effectively do that here with me today. Our folks from our fiscal operations staff that uh, can provide that to 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 the board. That 
Um, as you may very well know, FISCAL is the, the new statewide system um, for all the entire California state government. Um, to your point, um, computers um, you know work well when they, when, when they are working. Everyone recognizes that there's a transition that is um, going on currently for everyone specific to FISCAL. Um, and our goal, California's goal is, you know, at the end of that transition, we're going to be able to more effectively, more efficiently get, you know, the results um, in, in real time. If I didn't say it clearly from, from in, in my response at the beginning, um, we have fiscal staff that will be able to um, provide the information you folks need for real time, current day um, um, budgeting and um, more than happy to ensure that uh, you, you, this board gets the information it, it needs. Specific to BCPs, um, unfortunately, previous to me coming to the department, I wasn't familiar with the BCP process. Uh, saw kind of the tail end of that last session, uh, but this year is my first time going through, you know, step one through however many steps it does take. My point being is, in order for me to, um, you know, truly understand an issue, I want to be able to really um, understand it uh, as, as, as completely as possible. Um, and so, in no way do am I suggesting that it's going to take an entire uh, budget process for me to provide some kind of understanding of, you know, why BCPs don't go through the process specific to this board. Um, other boards, um, BCPs also don't go through the entire process. So to your point, um, more than happy to drill down and figure out specifically why, you know, A, B, and C didn't, didn't proceed. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I realize that you're excited and uh, in, in charge of things that preceded you. And uh, I know from your, our previous talks that uh, uh, your goal, of course, is to make things better, smoother. Uh, as you learned, we're, we're difficulties now, and uh, I'm sure our concerns are probably just the same as everybody else's. And uh, uh, they always say we speak to go disagree. So hopefully, in presenting these things forward, that you can prioritize those issues. Uh, Appreciate you saying that. Before I hand the uh, mic over to uh, Mr. Castrillo, um, you know, this notion of squeaky wheel gets the grease maybe has a negative connotation. Um, in all, um, let me be just explicit in saying that in every way, shape, or form, I'm going to try to be as collaborative as possible in towards creative problem solving. In order to create a problem solve, the issues obviously need to be communicated. And so, in no way, shape, or form should anyone feel that bringing concerns to my attention is a squeaky, squeaky bit. Uh, President Smith, I just wanted to highlight that the director mentioned the director's quarterly coming up on the 29th and open to executive officers and board presidents. Um, pretty committed to engaging in a dialogue on this. That's why we have, we're going to have um, a piece on BCPs and a piece on fiscal in that upcoming director's quarterly. Um, as you mentioned, you can't imagine you're the only folks uh, asking and wondering about this. Um, we hear that from our boards, and we want to make sure that we're engaged in an open dialogue on that. So um, just, again, would we'll take the opportunity to plug the upcoming directors quarterly and um, an opportunity to speak with you about both these items in a little bit more detail. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules to be here, and we look forward to our continued uh, collaborative efforts, and uh, we're excited about uh, what we've seen so far. Thank you so much. Pleasure being here. Thank you. Mr. President, can I just make one? Yes. To your earlier point, uh, Mr. Deputy Director, I recently attended one of the past board trainings and um, I thought it was very insightful. It was very well informed. So thank you for you and your team um, on the show. Thank you for that. Appreciate that feedback. You're welcome. Uh, so, our next order of business, we're going to go back on schedule and uh, I will solicit the Nomination for the office of uh, president. Do you have any nominations? I would like to nominate Dr. Zamuno. Are, are there any other nominations for the office of president? I would like to nominate Dr. Zamuno. Okay. So we have two 
terminations uh, without any others. Uh, I guess we go for a vote at this point. Roll call for the vote, please. Dr. Zimuda? Yes. Dr. Lally? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Buhari? Yes. Megan Blair? Yes. Andrew Marino? Yes. Claudia Mercado? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have the Office of uh, Vice President, and I would like to put forward the name of Dr. James Lally, PO, as uh, Vice uh, President. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, we'll go for the roll call. Dr. Zimuda? Yes. Dr. Lally? Yes. Dr. Kupari? Yes. Megan Blair? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Marino? Yes. Claudia Mercado? Yes. Uh, next, uh, for the Office of Secretary Treasurer, I would like to put forth the name of Dr. An uh, Cyrus Bukhari, PO. Are there any other suggestions? None seen. May we take a vote, please? Dr. Zamuda? Yes. Dr. Lally? Yes. Dr. Bukhari? Yes. Megan Blair? Yes. Andrew Marino? Yes. Claudia Mercado? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I would like to go back on our, our time schedule, uh, move to the administrative hearing for time constraints so that uh, I want to make sure. Do we have to do that? No. Yeah, I want to go to the hearing. Then. I'm just trying to estimate everybody's time since we've got a late start. Uh, so first of all, our court reporter is here. Thank you. Our administrative judge, we'd like to invite you to the top of the dais here. This time I would like to uh, turn the meeting over to our administrative judge. I would like to thank her for being here with us today. And uh, for those of you um, who are guests for the first time, students, uh, this is a legal proceeding and there's a court reporter here. Uh, we ask that you turn off your cell phones. Uh, we ask that you, uh, uh, if you have any discussion or problems or phone calls, that you leave the room so that there's no interruption to the proceedings. Thank you so much.
President Zamudo, and I believe the first piece we are going to hear is with Dr. Karam. If he can please come forward. Doctor, you're represented by counsel? Okay, very good. And if uh, your counsel can provide her business card or his business card. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A few seconds here on my computer. Besides, it wants to work this morning. Okay. <coughs> all right, everyone, all set? Yes, sir. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm the Board of Board. My name is Pat Chan. I'm the Deputy Attorney General here on behalf of the Hospital of Board of California. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and uh, call, call, call the case on the record. We have court reporter all set? Okay. We are here this morning before the Osteopathic Medical Board to review two petitions, one being with Dr. Anthony Benjamin Karam, who is seated before us. Uh, this is a petition for reinstatement of the license, OAH number 2017-120408. We also have another petition matter in the petition for termination of probation, Arsen Albanyan, that's OAH 2017-120396. We will first be addressing Dr. Karam's petition. My name is Danette Brown, and I'm the administrative law judge that will be presiding over these proceedings this morning. Um, I am seated here with the members of the board, and I would like to have them identify themselves for the record, please, starting with uh, the person to my far left. I'm James M. Lally, D.O. Joseph A. Zaluto, D.O. Charlie McCullough, public board member. Andrew Moreno, public board member. Cyrus Buhari, DO. Okay. Good morning to you all. And, uh, and Megan Blair, public board <laughs> member. Okay, thank you. 
May I take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General, please? Yes. Um, good morning again, Your Honor. Tan Tran, Deputy Attorney General, on behalf of the California Board. Good morning to you, Mr. Tran. Good morning, Your Honor. Vanessa Raven, on behalf of Dr. Correa. Good morning to you both. All right. Uh, now we will proceed with the hearing this morning. Uh, since the, the, the burden is on the petitioner, I will allow you to go first. And uh, if you'd like to make an opening statement at this time, Perfect. So, just a very brief opening statement. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor, and members of the board. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be heard here today on Dr. Karam's petition for reinstatement. Uh, we have provided you with copies of the petition, the paper petition that we have previously submitted to the board. There are also three additional documents in the binders that we have provided that we would like to submit at this time, as long as there is no objection from counsel. I haven't actually read it, but I'm pretty sure I will not have object, but I, I would like to review it. Of course, and I'm, we're happy to allow you the opportunity to do that. What the, numbers are they? The, they are the last three items, so it should be 17, 18, and 19. They are updated uh, letters from the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation and from CEPEP stating that Dr. Karam is currently in good standing with his monitoring program in Kentucky and also three additional uh, seating items. As I am sure you are all aware, uh, based on the petition that we have already submitted, and Dr. Karam's license was revoked in California as a result of some discipline that he faced in Kentucky due to an open invasion that he self-reported to the Kentucky board. He has since undergone treatment and uh, sits before you today in a healthy, stable place. He's currently practicing medicine in Kentucky and is seeking reinstatement of his license in California, both to clear his record of this revoked license and to open up the opportunity of him being allowed to practice again someday in California. Uh, we are all, I believe, in this room incredibly aware of the mass opioid addiction issues that are facing this country right now. And uh, the medical profession is still seeking balance in the issues of pain control and in the potential for addiction. That being said, Dr. Karam, fully takes responsibility for his own actions and for the issues that brought him to this place. But with time and intensive treatment, uh, he has come to the place now where he is uh, able to move forward with his life and has learned how to deal with both his addiction and the underlying issues that trigger it. So we are here today seeking reinstatement of his license so that he can get back into the emergency department and so that he can be part of the solution with what he has learned with his hard fought knowledge uh, regarding these issues instead of part of the problem. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Raymond. Mr. Tran, opening statement. Um, I don't have an opening statement. I'd just like to clarify the procedural history of the the matter. Uh, the petitioner's license was revoked pursuant to a default decision in order, and that's uh, my number two exhibit. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clear that it was a default decision in order, and part of that an accusation was filed, which is my exhibit number one. All right. Any presentation of evidence? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Kramer would like to testify. Okay. And at this point, Dr. Kramer, I'm going to put you under oath, so if you can kindly raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Your Honor, I do swear. Thank you, sir. All right, the witness. Uh, where would you like him for his testimony? Should he remain at table, or is there somewhere else in the room that you'd like him to be? Board members, do you have a preference? If not, uh, I think he's fine where he is. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 
So we're just going to share this microphone here. So make sure when you testify that you are speaking into it. Thank you. So Dr. Krim, if you could please share with us all first, what is your sobriety date? Uh, my sobriety date is June 23rd, 2014. And you have abstained from the use of any alcohol or any controlled substances since that date. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So let's talk a little bit first about you. I want to talk about your background and your history. First of all, can you tell us uh, your educational background? Yes. Uh, I went to uh, medical school at Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine, graduating uh, with honors in 2002, and went to residency at Akron General Medical Center uh, for emergency medicine. I was chief resident and graduated and finished completed that program in 2005. And when did you first obtain your osteopathic license? Uh, my osteopathic license in 2002 when I and that was here in California? Of uh, the, um, the, like, yes, um, the osteopath, California Osteopathic Medical License uh, was my first uh, medical license. I moved straight here from Ohio in 2005. Okay. Are you licensed in any other states? I'm also licensed in Kentucky. And you currently practice in Kentucky? Yes, uh, in Kentucky I do, I work for Story Consulting Services and provide uh, new physical examinations for the state uh, disability uh, program. Do you have any board certifications? Uh, emergency medicine. Is that current? Right now it is not current. As my license in Kentucky is restricted, I have, uh, I was boarded in 2006 when I completed my, successfully completed my boards. And, and uh, so in 10 years, uh, recertification is required, which is I cannot do with a restricted license. So my plan for that is uh, once my license is unrestricted to uh, recertify. Okay. And is that recertification, uh, is the blockage to that the restriction in Kentucky or is it the revoked California license? It, uh, that would be both. Both. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> So before you were working for story consultants doing these uh, workers' compensation reviews, tell us a little bit about your professional background. Yes. Uh, I started working in California in 2005, my first job out of residency uh, in the emergency department in uh, Reading and Red Bluff, uh, where I worked um, until 2011. Um, I... Uh, um, and I was also assistant medical director at St. Elizabeth Medical Center uh, in Red Bluff, and I uh, enjoyed my colleagues and my work very much. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about why we're here. So can you tell us just briefly your history of how your addiction first began? Yes. Uh, in 2009, I was involved in a mountain biking accident and uh, had several injuries, and that was my first exposure to uh, opiate pain medications. Um, prior to that, I had never had a, a drug of any sort in my life. And after that, I um, became addicted to opiates uh, almost immediately and had difficulties getting off the uh, opiate pain medications, uh, hydrocodone initially, and then oxycodone. And um, I had a physician prescribing them to me here in California in 2009. And um, during that time, I um, had recent, prior to that, prior to my um, accident, I had some life stressors also going on. I had a, a divorce prior to that, and um, um, was um, in a new relationship of which uh, resulted in I have two daughters, uh, young daughters that are eight and seven now, one of which has seizure disorder, the uh, eight-year-old. And I say that in that um, it's a part of, of the problems I've identified that contributed to my addiction, uh, and played a, a, a role, uh, which is also part of how um, I identify that and treat that. Okay. 
So, so these issues began for you in 2009. That's correct. While you were here in California. Yes. At some point, you moved to Kentucky. Yes, in uh, February of 2011, I moved to Kentucky. Uh, my parents and uh, uh, brother uh, lived there, and um, I think it was commonly um, known as a geographical cure. I was seeking to uh, um, resolve my problem with um, opiate addiction. And I thought moving my family, my family and daughters, closer to uh, home and or my, where my parents were in Kentucky um, and away from uh, the doctor prescribing to me, I would culture these out. In my head, I thought that would work, which was not a very good idea. And did it work? It did not work. Okay. So how did you continue uh, with these issues once you were in Kentucky? Once I was in Kentucky, I um, no longer had um, a physician prescribing them to me. And um, I did not uh, want to um, go to a new physician and tell them about my problems. And so I, um, after going through some withdrawal, um, prescribed medication to family members, and hydrocodone, and opiate pain medication, and I took them myself. This all eventually came to a head at some point. How did that happen? Yes. Um, that quickly came to a head um, from March uh, 2011 till uh, September of 2011, um, which is when, in 2000, uh, September 2011, um, I returned into the Physicians Health Foundation, um, prompted by uh, one of my colleagues. How were you prompted by one of your colleagues to do that? Um, it came to his attention, my colleague, that. Um, I had prescribed um, opiate pain medication, hydrocodone, to um, a family member who was not seen in the emergency department, and he confronted me, and um, and he, I, he advised me what uh, I should do, and which was to go to the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation, and, which I did. What is the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation? Uh, the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation is a panel that works uh, closely, uh, a panel of um, uh, including a physician, Dr. Jones, and um, that uh, works closely with the uh, Kentucky Medical Board, um, and is a uh, my liaison to the Kentucky Medical Board. Um, and they do my monitoring, um, drug monitoring, and um, and uh, guided me to treatment. Okay. So the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation is an entity that works with the Kentucky Medical Board for physician addiction issues and other issues. That's correct. Okay. So you reported to the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation, and then what happened? Yes. And they uh, advised me to go to um, inpatient uh, residential treatment for uh, addiction, which I did. Okay. How long did you do that for? I went, uh, I was there for a little over three months and uh, successfully completed that program in um, February, early February 2012. Okay. And what happened after that? Um, I was uh, um, successfully um, discharged from their program and, um, uh, and uh, started a, a contract with the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation uh, with a monitoring, uh, which includes uh, daily uh, call in for urine drug screens on average once a week. And um, I also uh, went home to uh, a similar stressful situation uh, with a, a relationship that was I was trying to salvage. Um, again, one of the stressors uh, that um, I have identified as uh, one of the problems that I, at that time, did not deal with. And, uh, so um, that... Um, I'd say that and then <coughs> after several months I relapsed. Okay. Tell us just a little bit about your relapse. That was in January of 2013, correct? That's correct. Okay. Tell us about that. So, uh, during that process, uh, or during that time, I uh, was experiencing uh, depression, which is something I was not um, accustomed to. Um, in fact, I really wasn't sure what was going on with myself. Um, and as a physician, uh, 
you would think I would understand that. However, when it was me, uh, I didn't recognize it. Um, I knew I wasn't right. And um, I, my focus was on the wrong things. Instead of myself and self-care, I was focusing on salvaging my relationship. And that uh, was not successful. Um, and um, my uh, fiance, the mother of my children and my children, they, they left and returned to California in October of 2012. And um, I emotionally, after that, was not doing very well. And uh, depression was worse. I did seek treatment uh, with Dr. Elliot. Uh, he is the physician psychiatrist uh, who works also uh, directly uh, associated with the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation. And um, was put on antidepressants, which um, were not working. And ultimately, I um, uh, self-medicated and went to street drugs, uh, particularly uh, opiates. And those showed up in your talk screen? Yes, and um, not soon after that, I had a positive urine drug screen and hair follicle test for uh, opiates and cocaine. What happened after this relapse? was identified? Uh, once that was identified, I uh, was in extreme panic. Um, I was in denial. I was trying to not face my consequences. And I was also having financial um, difficulties and needed to sell my house. And it was recommended I return to treatment, which I did eventually do. However, my delays in that uh, uh, resulted in my Kentucky license being suspended. Okay. You eventually got yourself into a new treatment program. Yes. What program was that? Uh, so uh, I did go to treatment in 2013 as directed. Uh, in uh, early June 2013, I returned to MAR, uh, for, um, which is where I did my first treatment as well. Okay. And where is that? That is in Atlanta, Georgia. What did that program consist of? It uh, consisted of um, obtaining a job, which I did, uh, and having a daily meetings, attending um, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, um, and um, group sessions and therapy. When were you discharged from that program? I was discharged in April of 2014. Um, however, it was not in favorable. It was not on favorable terms. Um, I had relapsed on Kratom, um, uh, which is a plant-like drug you get uh, at the gas stations and smoke shops, things like that. And, um, and that was on a positive urine drug screen. So you were discharged from the program because of the positive drug screen? That's correct. And when was that second positive drug screen? Uh, April uh, 2014. Okay. What happened after that second positive drug screen? Uh, that was the end of April of uh, 2014. I contacted uh, the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation and uh, informed them of what had uh, happened and uh, worked with them to uh, find a, another treatment center. Okay, so this time when you had a relapse, you communicated with the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation and worked with them. That's correct. What did they advise you to do? They uh, worked on finding a, uh, a dual diagnosis uh, treatment center that also uh, focused on depression um, and in addition to addiction. Okay. Which was at uh, COPAC, which is in Brandon, Mississippi. Okay. So you went to Mississippi to this new program. How was this program different from the one that you were in in Georgia? I, uh, the program was different. Uh, it was uh, focused on dual diagnosis. One thing in particular it had was one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with counselors um, to discuss the root causes of, of, not, of not just addiction, but my depression and uh, poor decision-making. Um, and that I found um, to be really helpful, uh, which was not prior uh, treatment center, it was more group therapy, um, and not uh, intensive one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, I think also I was um, 
had a chance to look at my failures and relapse and to look at what was going on with me, why I would do that and sacrifice my whole, everything I've worked for, you know, to take a look at that and to um, do some self-analysis and learn from um, those, you know, those poor decisions and relapse. So it's my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that you entered into that program in COPEC on June 22nd of 2014, or June 23rd, 2014. That's correct. And that is your current sobriety date. That's correct. Okay. So since you entered into that program, you have not had any further relapses. That's correct. Okay. What kind of treatment are you receiving now? Uh, since uh, successful completion at uh, COPAC, which was in um, end of January 2015, I uh, continued what I learned there. Um, and number one thing was to prior to prioritize my sobriety and myself first. Um, I do that with uh, one is self care. Um, I had not done that before. Focusing on getting sleep, basic things, uh, nutrition, um, being self-aware of my emotional states, and accepting that it's okay to feel angry or depressed. Um, and two, that leads to uh, talking to someone about that. I, I never, prior to that, I didn't see the value in that, which I, had, I now see is extremely valuable. Um, having a support group um, of close uh, friends and people that I discuss things with. Uh, for example, currently um, I have uh, someone who's also a professional uh, that I've been uh, communicating with and meeting with regularly for the last uh, almost two years. Um, he's also a professional. He has two daughters, uh, young daughters. Uh, we have similar stories. He has also um, addiction, and he's also uh, maintained sobriety for several years, as have I, and um, we discuss things that stressful things. So stress uh, continues to be a part of life and, and I um, had to learn to deal with that. And so those are, that's how I do that now. So that's part of your sort of informal support network. That's correct. You also continue to have a formal monitoring with the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation, correct? That's correct. And what does that consist of? Uh, first uh, is um, the obvious near and drug strains. Um, I daily uh, have call-ins uh, to um, do, on average, once a week uh, urine drug screens. Um, and they, uh, I also um, report to them. Uh, um, I go to AA meetings uh, regularly and report to them the meetings that I do go to. And um, to have a, a sponsor, which I have, um, and report to them that. And um, also, I had to complete the CPEP, which is the Center for professional uh, um, and, uh, development of physicians. Uh, where I had not worked for uh, over two years, uh, I had to complete that in order to uh, return to work. Um, those are the, uh, the large part of the option. Do you also continue to receive uh, formal therapy with Dr. Elliott? Yes, in addition to that, I continue to see uh, Dr. Elliott. How much longer does your monitoring program in Kentucky last at this point? It's a uh, five-year contract, uh, of which um, I have uh, almost two years into it. So three more years on your monitoring program in Kentucky. A little more than three years, yes. So at this point, you're living and working in Kentucky. Why are you asking this board to reinstate your California license? Yes. So uh, I currently work for Story Consulting Services doing the disability evaluations, as I mentioned. Uh, my specialty is emergency medicine, and um, to I would like, and that's my passion, and which is where I would like to return. And I did secure a job at St. Joseph Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. However, um, if you have a license in any state that is revoked, Um, thus, um, in addition to that, uh, the 
future prospect of working and living in California, I would also like to have that option as my two daughters do live here in Sacramento. So you still do have ties in California? Yes, I am here frequently. You shared with us your history with addiction and your relapse struggles and uh, understanding where you are today. What can you tell this board to assure them that you won't relapse again? Yes, thank you for that question and the opportunity to answer that. Um, I have, I'm going on four years of sobriety and that um, time um, has allowed me to one, heal in my brain and to treat um, the underlying, and identify and treat the underlying triggers with depression and stress, which will be a part of life, and to have developed coping skills and to practice them um, until I can incorporate that into my way of life. Uh, and so that being, you know, one, prioritizing sobriety in that way of life. Um, Excuse me one second. Um, Megan Blair's having a little difficulty hearing on the conference call. Could you speak into the microphone oh, a little bit more? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, prioritizing a sobriety and making that my way of life and doing that with taking care of myself first, self-care. Uh, identifying in the past I had tried to do everything else first, salvage a relationship, um, rush back to work, um, treat other, you know, help my, uh, I had medical problems with my daughter and my father and to, to give myself to them and not take care of myself. That did not work. Um, I, I know this. and. So I do that, I take care of myself, I exercise regularly, that is very important to me. Uh, I, I maintaining a good diet and sleep is extremely important to me. Uh, my support group is also extremely important to me, as I know, particularly in regards to depression and emotional states, uh, to have someone to um, take the power out of those emotions by discussing them with uh, someone, particularly um, my support group. And um, that has been quite effective. Okay, no further questions, John. Okay, thank you, Ms. Raven. Thank you, Dr. Crom. Cross examination? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for appearing. My name is Ken Tran. I'm the Deputy Attorney General. I represent the Osteopathic Board. On these type. You just move the microphone if you want to talk this way, please. In these type of hearings, I try not to be adversarial, uh, but my questions are meant to elicit answers to enable, hopefully to enable the board to make an informed decision because the purpose of these proceedings is primarily public protection. That's our main goal. So even if I think you're a nice guy, I have to ask you these questions. Yeah. Um, uh, you said in 2009 after your mountain biking accident, uh, that was your first exposure to drugs, correct? That's correct. Right. Okay. Um, but you were also involved with cocaine at a later point. Later yeah. Point. Have you ever tried uh, illicit drugs like marijuana in the past? And no, I'll just let you know that the board members want complete honesty. So yes, I am. Yes. Um, and uh, when did you first use marijuana? Two thousand and ten. Okay, prior to 2009, prior to your mountain biking accident, have you ever tried any illicit drugs? Alcohol, but no, never illicit drugs. Okay. And what, can you uh, kind of describe your alcohol usage uh, prior to 2009? Prior to 2009, my alcohol usage was uh, uh, sparingly. I uh, used social settings, uh, dinners. Uh, It had not caused any problems in my life. Um, and I had not, uh, not had not identified it as uh, a problem at that time. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the board members who are present here today how you got involved with cocaine? Uh, yes, in uh, 2013, um, I when I had relapsed, uh, I. Um, obtained them from the street and uh, street drugs and from uh, people I had known 
and um, I basically took whatever um, I was reckless and took whatever they gave me or what was available. I preferred opiates if it wasn't available. I took that. What do you mean by uh, taking from the street? Because I, if I wanted cocaine, I wouldn't know where to get it. What, what, can you clarify that? Uh, yes. Uh, during that time, I uh, was not prioritizing uh, who I chose to make my acquaintances with and um, would ask them if they knew how to get me uh, pain pills. And um, they did, and uh, would, I, I presume from drug dealers okay, that who, they knew. Okay, who are they? Uh, acquaintances uh, in, in Kentucky. Um, one in particular, he's actually no longer with us. He's uh, um, he was a professional in the area who also had a drug addiction, and uh, he has since passed. Uh, in Kentucky has a big opioid epidemic uh, problem, correct? It, it, yes, it is. And uh, some of the people that you were talking to, uh, were they uh, also physicians or uh, medical professionals? No, uh, he was, this person in particular, that the actual person who got me uh, the street drugs, opiates and cocaine, uh, he uh, was a businessman in the area whom uh, I had uh, met through uh, a friend who was also, uh, who was in a uh, sober uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And uh, we had actually were at a, a, a football game, and that's how we, I actually became acquainted with him. And, um, and it was later on, I, I could identify that he, he drank a lot and uh, felt like I felt comfortable asking him if he could get pain pills for me. So you became acquainted with these people at an Alcoholics Anonymous uh, uh, station? For lack of a better word, uh, where you that's went. not correct. The, I'll clarify. Thank you. Uh, the uh, I, a friend who is sober uh, is friends with this other friend. They were professional businessmen, quite successful ones. Um, and the uh, the person who provided me them was not associated with Alcoholics Anonymous. In 2011, you were going through a divorce, correct? That's right. Okay. And um, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, your, uh, your wife had two children, so two minor children? Two daughters, yes. And there were allegations that you had uh, uh, prescribed to your wife and the two minor children of parking 25 on your doses and parking five months, correct? And then, uh, yeah, to clarify, uh, she has two daughters from, uh, not my two daughters, they're young. She had two older daughters from a prior relationship, and, and that's correct. Okay. And why were you prescribing narcotics to minors? And I was uh, desperate um, and going and depressed and not in my right state of mind and in regards to my what was going on. And um, made an egregious decision to do that out of desperation. Uh, I what would happen is I would I was trying to quit and would go through severe withdrawals and then uh, do that. And, but did the minor children need any of those narcotics that were being? No, they did not need them. And how old were they at, at the time? Eighteen. 18 or 19, and 16 or 17. Um, I'm a little confused. You said you mentioned uh, during your direct that you had children about eight, nine years old. My two daughters. This yes. is another relationship. These, no, the, uh, the same person. However, she has two children from uh, those are her daughters from a prior really her okay. prior relationship. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. And you currently work at. Uh, Story Consulting, which does uh, workers' comp. Uh, it's, it's not workers' comp, but it's uh, disability examinations for uh, 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 people applying for state disability. And is it also some of our, Is it also due to uh, opioid addiction and things like that? So that's correct. So you'll be doing pain management uh, when you resume 
you need to work there, correct? Some of, some of your jobs will include being in? Uh, in the emergency department, yes. But uh, for the disability, no. I, I don't manage them. I, I do physical examinations and assess whether they are disabled or not. Uh, I, I don't man provide them with um, medical care or treatment. And part of that assessment, whether or not they're disabled or not, would be, would be your uh, uh, evaluation of whether or not they're addicted to opioids, right? Uh, the way that the current, that, that particular position, they have a separate, uh, it's a, a mental health evaluation. that They, they determine that, so I, I don't personally determine that okay. part the, of the exam. If the board members were to reinstate your California license, uh, would you agree uh, to a restriction that you could not practice pain management due to your past addictions? I would uh, be grateful to have uh, the ability to to work in the emergency department and um, in any restriction uh, I would accept. So you would accept uh, additional monitoring from California, five years probation, things like that? Absolutely. Um, have you ever been under the influence of drugs or alcohol while treating patients? Uh, I have been under the influence of opiates while treating patients in uh, 2011. And were any patients harmed, to your knowledge? No, they were not. And that's uh, according to your uh, uh, view, correct? That they were not harmed? Uh, yes. Yeah, they, uh, the medical board did, and the uh, Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation did uh, do pull my charts during that time and did uh, a chart review some records as well. Uh, you, were, uh, you also were involved with some drug diversion of fentanyl in the past, correct? And that was an allegation uh, that was uh, done um, in September of 2011 that uh, a nurse had um, reported a fentanyl um, taken by me, and um, although uh, and I confirmed that I, I did take that and um, consumed it orally. Okay. Um, so you're saying you're not, that was an allegation, so you're, you're denying that allegation, or you're admitting that you did participate in drug diversion, uh, which included fe uh, fentanyl diversion? And that's correct. It was a one-time. Uh, what was the fentanyl for? I had conscious sedation. And why? Why would you need fentanyl? It was for a reduction of a shoulder dislocation and to treat pain. What, what, why were you? Why was that necessary for your shoulder? Were you bike, mountain biking again, or playing football? Or? Uh, for myself, I was, uh, this was in 2011, and um, I was no, and I um, did not prescribe it to myself, or I did not, I was, that was when I was prescribing medications to um, family members, and I had stopped doing that and was withdrawing. Um, the, uh, there was a medical consultant in Kentucky who uh, pulled your charts and reviewed them, correct? From the medical board, yes. Okay. And he did about 11 cases where he uh, stated that they were below minimum standards with respect to the quality of care with 11 charts, correct? Something like that. That's correct. Okay. When was the last time you practiced medicine in California? 2000, January 2011. Uh, California emergency physicians. What did you do for California emergency physicians? I was a uh, worked in the emergency department um, at San Elizabeth uh, Medical Center and Mercy Medical Center. And, um, why did you? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, when did you stop working at California emergency physicians? Uh, the 
end of January, early February 2011, and moved to Kentucky. And why again did you move to Kentucky? Uh, the, uh, I was desperately trying to both the medication, and so I, I moved to Kentucky thinking I would have a geographical cure, which is, is um, uh, did not work, of course, um, and to do bring, um, I thought maybe bringing my daughters and my family closer to my parents would be, um, would help that situation. Okay. Um, can you tell me what you mean by geographical cure? Yes, it's a, it's a term I use to, uh, geographical, uh, not, and it's not just that I use, uh, it's a, to, uh, by moving, you know, moving away from where you are having you know, access to, uh, pain medication, then I would no longer have access, and then I would stop, and then my problem would be solved. It's not a, it's not a healthy uh, decision. But why did you specifically choose Kentucky as opposed to? Um, I had visited there, uh, my parents lived there, and uh, I, I took them uh, along with uh, my fiance uh, and took my daughters there to visit them, and we, uh, I enjoyed it there, and uh, we discussed moving, um, and so um, we moved there. But Kentucky has rampant drug use, correct? It does. Okay. Did you know that? What, what was it? I actually did not. Um, you also suffered from depression, you stated? That's correct. Okay. Uh, what was the cause of the depression? Uh, opiate addiction and coming off of the medications and um, failure to deal with my the stressors that had accumulated in my life um, and as a kind of in, going in that and the addition together. What would you say are your stressors now, if any? Um, the same stressors as before. I have uh, uh, my daughter, she still has seizure disorder. She openly had brain surgery. Um, my you know, parents, my father, you know, he recently had back surgery, um, and um, same stressors. I just they uh, don't seem so stressful now. I, I deal with them. I have my support group. I take care of myself. Um, I'm no longer depressed, and um, and that makes all the difference. And you have relapsed uh, at least twice, correct? That's correct. What if you relapse? What if they put you? What if they reinstate your license? Or what if they mean the board reinstate your California license and you relapse? What would you do? Well, I would have to. We're going to do different. I notify them and let them know. Um, whereas in the past, I, I did not do that, um, and so that would be um, at least something I would do. And you currently uh, are employed in Kentucky, correct? That's correct. Is your employment in Kentucky dependent on you getting reinstated in California? The uh, the current job I have, which is doing uh, disability evaluations, is not dependent upon um, getting reinstated uh, in California. The, the job in the emergency department, uh, which is um, my specialty, it does require that. And I have not begun that job yet. Not to belabor the point, but uh, why did you specifically choose cocaine as opposed to some other pain killing drug or opioid? Or uh, go to other it was what was available. Uh, I didn't particularly enjoy it at all. Uh, Opiates is what I, um, was my addiction and what I worked, which I, which I self-medicated with essentially. Uh, cocaine was uh, just there and made a poor decision and, and took some. Yeah, was, <clears throat> where'd you go to college again? I'm sorry. A medical school, Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, where'd you want to go? Undergrad, I went to Malone College. And where is that? It's in Canton, Ohio. Uh, you a football fan? I am. Um, 
Well, in college, did you ever use marijuana cocaine? I did not. I did not drink there either. It was a private school and had a contract not to drink. Did you play football? Uh, in high school. What position did you play? Uh, linebacker and running back. Okay. Did they ever give you opioids uh, while you played football? I never had opioids while playing football. I like to open it up to the members. Do you have any questions? Hi. Uh, before we do that, do you have anything on redirect, Mr. Raven? No, Your Honor, I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Now we'll open it up to the board members for any questions for Dr. Karam. Starting with my left. Dr. Karam, I got to tell you, reading through all this, you had some pretty crappy times. I have a little bit of issue about diverting medications while you're working, but it sounds like you've explained it. You were given back your DEA, it looks like. That's correct. Okay. So they think that you're capable of managing the drugs. That's correct. So government's <coughs> We as a board, you know, have to be concerned about the safety of the general population. When, uh, when is your revocation with us or suspension with us supposed to end? Yes. I mean, we'll revoke. When does it end? It doesn't. We revoked it. We didn't do a stay of revocation. No. We just revoked it. It was a default. Oh, it you was were a default. Really not doing good. I was not. Okay. <laughs> so, so your plan, as I understand it, is, is right now you are working, and because you have this flag of the revocation here, you cannot do what you'd like to do, which is the emergency room. That's correct. I would also add to that that uh, part of my restriction with the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation is to complete the. Uh, a course with the CEDA, the Central Physicians uh, Educational uh, for Physicians and Professionals and Physicians. And part of their requirement is that you go to the emergency department and uh, be monitored, particularly for conscious sedation um, and, um, and trauma, uh, and to com successively complete so many cases uh, and report to them any chart reviews. Uh, over the course of a year. You do, you've done that. I know I cannot do that until I'm in the emergency department. Okay. So even if we did uh, reverse our position, you would still have a period of time where you are going to be monitored by this program. That's correct. That's like our pace. Sounds no, like it's pace. It's more like Maximus, I think. Maximus? Okay. Okay, I, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Lowy. Next in line. Uh, Dr. Krim, um, looking at your data, you've been sober for three years, six months. Congratulations. Thank you. It's hard work. It's a job that occurs every day. Congratulations for that. Um, your limitation with Kentucky is uh, until you complete the upcoming course. I'm trying to understand the timeline. Yes, uh, so that it's part of the limitation. I, I, I have a, con a five-year contract, of which I'm uh, a year and nine months into, and um, so that will continue. Um, the, and part of that contract is completing this course with the CPEP, which I've completed uh, the non ER, <coughs> the non-emergency medicine portion, um, and the emergency medicine portion uh, once I cannot until uh, um, I get uh, without uh, with a revoked license in another state, I can't return to the emergency department. Um, uh, next question is: Is there any limitations on your DEA certificate? Pardon? Me? Are there any limitations on your DEA certificate? Uh, the uh, I have to uh, provide a log of every narcotic or scheduled drug I prescribe. And um, send that monthly to the DA. And a three day limit. I have no further questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you for being here. Can you tell us, uh, you mentioned that you might, you're considering uh, relocating to California. When do you plan for that to take place? The, uh, it's an option I would like to, to keep available uh, to myself. I, the soonest it would be 
after completing the contract with the Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation, which would be um, in three years and three and a half or so months. Can you briefly tell us, um, you know, if, if you're talking to uh, future deals uh, that we're looking to get into the system, to this medical practice and make the likelihood out of it, can you tell them really briefly what's going to be the lesson learned and, um, also your biggest accomplishment in your profession as well. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Uh, you know, I, prior to being exposed to opiates, um, I would say it was the first time I had it, I, it was addiction. And you don't know until you've tried it. And so what I, I tell people is it's dangerous, just one dose. You can ruin your life or kill you. You see it every day. It's on TV, it's epidemic. And uh, I'm very passionate about that. Um, I wish it not, had not happened, obviously, but it did, and I've survived. And, um, and I'd like to help others and teach them how dangerous it is, even for surgery. Uh, you have to have surgery. I've seen people come out addicted for, from surgeries. Um, and so um, I think being aware of that is extremely important. Um, I, I, and to be aware of that with myself, uh, I thought I had accomplished a part of it uh, in emergency medicine uh, prior to this. And I think maybe I had that uh, I, I bad things didn't happen to me. <laughs> uh, or I was somehow immune from these things, which uh, I found out I am not. I'm just like anyone else. Um, and uh, disease can happen to anyone. And it so happened to me. And, uh, and as you can see, I you know, went down to a pretty dark place. In terms of your biggest accomplishment, then you feel like you're professional, then you're doing From a career standpoint, uh, I had always uh, I'd done extremely, extremely well in school. Um, in medical school, I topped my class, uh, in the top 10% of my class. Um, I did extremely well on all the boards, 99th percentile. I studied very hard. Uh, I was chief resident of emergency medicine. Came to California, uh, done quite well, went to leadership courses with California emergency physicians, and became assistant medical director at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Red Bluff. And, uh, and then that's uh, when my addiction started, that all went away. So you're hoping to bring back those accomplishments to the future? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So I've gotten back to, I love to study. I study all the time. Uh, as you can see from my CMEs, I'm always doing, you know, trauma and um, all, you know, all sorts of emergency medicine, continuing medical education. Um, yeah, even though my job is with disability, uh, uh, claimants uh, at Story Consulting. I, I enjoy history and physical examination, the foundation of medicine. And I, I, I truly, truly love that portion of it and, and doing it with a, a clear mind. A uh, mind also perspective about bad things happen. And, um, and I'm so grateful that I survived that, um, survived the depression, survived the addiction, and can now help others with that wisdom. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, just a few questions for you. Your license in California was revoked by default decision. Um, I'm curious at the time, why, why didn't you respond to that? Yes, yeah, thank, thank you for asking. Uh, at the time, it was 2013. And uh, I, uh, one, it was my responsibility to provide an accurate mailing address to the California. I also had like Metal Port, California before I moved. I did not do that in 2011. Therefore, I did not proceed it. Um, and uh, once it, I was aware of it, I was uh, um, it was after I w uh, it was already revoked because uh, there was a, a time frame. And so that I, that is, I think um, is, is what happened. You're currently on probation with the Kentucky Health Foundation. Just a point of clarification. 
I believe I read that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that was for an indefinite period, but in your testimony you said for five years. Do you understand? I think you're familiar with what I'm referring to. I do, yes. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, it's a, it's a five-year contract, and um, it may, it's uh, standard for uh, someone who, um, like myself, who had to go to treatment, um, particularly with um, the poor decisions I had made in 2011, particularly, um, to uh, put a restricted license indefinitely. And also what they typically do is after... Uh, four years of the contract, they remove that, and then you finish your contract in five years. And then sometimes they do extend the contract, which uh, I'm just grateful to be working in medicine, I will, uh, and doing my specialty. Uh, at some point, uh, I'm <laughs> humble, humble and would do whatever's required of me and go to any length. Sure, thank you. And you stated that you do have a sponsor, correct? That's correct. And um, you also stated that you attend AA meetings uh, regularly. How, what's what's schedule? What's the frequency? Of those meetings? I go to at least three a week, uh, sometimes more. And, and just lastly, at some point, if this board decides to give you back the your license and the, and your operation with Kentucky, what are your long term goals for for staying sober? Uh, continuing doing what I'm doing. Uh, most importantly, self care, prioritizing sobriety for the life, the rest of my life, taking care of myself, uh, you know, eating the you know, nutrition, exercise, sleeping, continuing with my support groups. Um, that has it is a it's a it has that alone has taken care of uh, helped me get uh, get over the depression and feel so much better about who I am, where I'm doing, how I feel emotionally. The bad itself is motivation in and of itself, and not apart from the consequences that, that, that that's kind of in addition to. And so, um, and you know, which includes, it's, you know, that support group is, you know, having a sponsor, uh, AA meetings, friends, family, uh, choosing wisely uh, those people, um, who I choose to hang out with. It would occur that you learned your lesson and, and correct me, but you would never want to put yourself in this situation ever. Absolutely not. Just a couple of quick ones. Um, when you were evaluated March 2016 by CPDP, they found some deficiencies in pain management and procedural sedation. Currently, you do none of that, but Presumably, in the emergency room, you'll be doing plenty of that. What have you done to correct those deficiencies? Yes, I've uh, done uh, continuing medical education, um, many, many hours of it, uh, in addition to self study, um, uh, in intent and all emergency medicine, um, and then up, which is the main book of emergency department, in addition to updated reviews on um, conscious sedation medications, uh, protocols. Um, what's new, um, and uh, and then also doing you know, CMEs as well, um, which I could provide. You know, which I provided. Did you recognize that the the practices you used in the past were not necessarily the safest for those patients? Correct. Absolutely. All right. And lastly, Ms. Moyer, who may be on the phone, um, do you have any questions? Really, a question. Um, it's more of a personal one. You mentioned that your father recently had back surgery, and then you also mentioned how you feel passionate about warning people about the dangers, um, including around surgery. And I was wondering if you took your past history and and spoke with him about and with your concerns or, or warnings and. How you dealt with that in your personal life? Thank you for the question. Um, I have. Uh, my dad, he's had multiple uh, spine surgeries uh, in his neck and lower back. And uh, his last uh, two surgeries, I, I did discuss with him um, how dangerous these medications are. Um, he was prescribed them, um, and he uh, um, did heed my advice and, and took them extremely sparingly for 
maybe post on day three and stuff. Thank you. I don't have further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blair. Um, anything else from the board? If not, uh, Mr. Tran, do you have any objections to any of the documents uh, that were in the binder or are in the binder? No, I do not. And I'd like to also uh, introduce the board's um, exhibits as well. Uh, number one, which is the petition for jurisdictional purposes. Uh, no, I mean, A. Uh, A uh, which is the petition for jurisdiction purposes. Number one, which is the accusation for all purposes. Uh, number two, the default decision in order. I would like to admit that for all purposes. And I also like to admit number 12, the amended reorder of the Commonwealth of Kentucky Board of Medical Licensure for all purposes as well. All right, so all of the uh, jurisdictional documents that you've identified will be admitted for jurisdictional purposes only and Exhibit 12 for all purposes. What about all the other documents? One and two also for all purposes. Okay. Yeah. And then what about three through? Uh, those, were, those were admitted um, uh, by Dr. Brown uh, as a part of this petition. I would like to admit those for jurisdictional purposes only. Okay. All right. And Ms. Raven, any? Objections, anything about the documents? No objections regarding the documents. Just wanted a clarification regarding the three additional documents that we had submitted that um, Mr. Tran had wanted to review if he has had an opportunity to do that if he has any objections to them. Uh, I reviewed them briefly. I don't have any objections. Okay, so the rest of the documents will be admitted for all purposes. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, anything in closing first? Um, actually, actually, Your Honor, before we go to closings, we do have another witness to call oh. over the phone. Uh, we were going to call uh, Dr. Corum's therapist, Dr. Elliot. Okay, very well. We can have just a moment to get that set up. Sure. Unfortunately, he had a period of time blocked out for patients, and I think we little, went a little longer than we were anticipating, so we may have missed him, but if we can try this is one other number. Okay, we'll try again, and then we'll, we'll address it. Thank you.
Vanessa Raven. I represent Dr. Corona. and we have an appointment to have uh, some testimony for with Dr. Elliot. Uh, unfortunately, we went a little long, but I'm wondering if he's available for that now. He is not available at this time. He's a patient. I'd be giving your number happy to call you if you finish it. No, no, that's all right. Thank you so much. So what I would ask at this point, because we unfortunately missed our time window that he had blocked with patients, uh, that if the board does find that it needs any additional evidence to determine this matter on behalf of Dr. Program, that we'd be allowed the opportunity to submit perhaps a declaration from Dr. Elliott or figure out some other way that we could uh, provide his testimony. Uh, Your Honor, under uh, tab eight, very uh, explicit, specific letter provided by Dr. Elliott speaking of the uh, progress that Dr. Karam has uh, made. All right, so with the testimony of Dr. Elliott been, you know, sort of, sort of along the same lines as the content of the letter in Exhibit 8? Yes. Okay, so it might be duplicative, but, you know, it kind of deprives the board of cross-examination. Exactly. Um, if the board is, you know, willing to accept that and move the testimony, and that way would pre, not preclude you, but you wouldn't have to submit a sworn declaration. Uh, is, is the board willing to uh, either? I move to accept the letter. Okay, uh, so the letter's already in evidence and it's gonna be part of the uh, exhibit packet for your consideration. And so no uh, necessity for a sworn declaration from Dr. Elliott. Okay, so. thank you. Okay. Um, and those uh, three additional documents, are they in the judge's binder? Uh, which binder do you have? Is it white or is it black? Those are not. Okay. Let me provide you with the uh, additional. Okay, terrific. Okay, so we've addressed all the documents. Uh, they're in evidence. Um, so we're going to commence with the closing argument at this time, and I'll have uh, Mr. Uh, I actually, I'll wait closing that on that. Okay, very good. Ms. Reagan, closing? Yes, sir. Thank you. Just a very briefly. Uh, thank you again for allowing us the opportunity. Get you used to my microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to come here today and to give Dr. Karim an opportunity to tell you his story. Um, you've seen the paper, you know what happened, you know his history and his issues, uh, but we appreciate um, the chance for him to come here and tell you how his life has changed, the work that he has done, uh, and the way that he anticipates being able to translate that into the future so that he can uh, really continue to rebuild his life and uh, get things back on the right track for himself and his daughters and his family. We completely, as Dr. Karam stated, uh, accept the fact that this board may require some restrictions on his license in order to ensure patient safety. Uh, we absolutely understand the tantamount importance of that and would not uh, object to any such restrictions. We would only ask that you keep in mind that he has another three years left on his monitoring contract in Kentucky that requires him to be there to complete it. So if this board does uh, submit any location-based restrictions on his probation, for example, requiring practice in California within a certain amount of time or things like that, then it allows for those, uh, allows for his monitoring program in Kentucky to be finished before that would commence. Um, we hope that the stringent monitoring that he continues to be under, both by CPEP and Kentucky Physicians Health Foundation, as well as uh, the requirements that he has with the DEA, uh, will suffice to satisfy this board that he is being appropriately monitored, and that if any issues do arise, that they will immediately be addressed. Uh, however, he does feel absolutely confident that he can move forward from this point without any future issues uh, that will take him down that same path. Uh, thank you again, and that's all. All right, 
Thank you, Ms. Ring. With that, the matter is submitted. The record is closed, and we are off the record. Good luck to you, Dr. Crom. Thank you. Uh, does the board want to take a brief recess? Take a brief five-minute uh, refreshment uh, break, and uh, we'll let the uh, next uh, physician and his uh, attorney. Board members, and may I take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General for the record, please? Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Tan Chen, Deputy Attorney General on behalf of the California House Bill. Thank you, and good morning to you, Mr. Tran. And you, sir, are? I am Arsene Malbandian, DO, representing myself. And uh, Dr. Malbandian, um, if uh, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about this morning's proceedings that you're representing yourself. Uh, you are aware that you could have had an attorney represent you here this morning? Yes. Okay, your documents and uh, the board will have to be provided with uh, copies of those additional documents at some point. Do you need a copy? Uh, yes, please, as well as the rest of the board. And um, I, I'm assuming they're going to want to ask you some questions about it at, at some point. I was, so, yeah, I, was, I was told to only bring three copies for the judge. I will provide more copies. These are just the regular quarterly reports. I'm happy to provide them. They have been submitted before and received by the board. I just don't have the actual copies. For the okay, no worries. Uh, you can go ahead and come board and submit that, and then we can address whether or not there's any mm -hmm. issues that Mr. Tran may have about these documents. This is Megan. Megan, okay. Megan, 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 Megan. Yes, Ms. Blair? Well, you're coming in kind of in and out. Can you speak louder? Sure. If I could ask the physician to speak into the microphone, I wasn't able to hear um, uh, any part of his opening statement. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> well, at some, I, I know all this stuff is probably going to come out again. So, um, you know, as you know, that he's seeking, he's seeking to um, terminate his probation. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, and then you are loud and clear. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, and he also submitted a, a document that has to do with um, third quarter psychiatric evaluation. Is that right, Dr. Malbongian? No, the submittals are for my quarterly reports that I've complied with all the laws, and my uh, practice monitor also um, submits quarterly reports. So these are just additional. Okay, uh, Ms. Blair, can you hear Dr. Malbongian? I could hear that sentence. It's still a little bit faint, but um, I could I could hear it. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Galbani, if you could just kindly just raise your voice just a little bit more, that would be fantastic. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Um, with that, then, since uh, Dr. Galbani, you are the petitioner, do you want to testify and just kind of tell the board uh, what you've done by way of rehabilitation? I would love to. Yeah. Okay. Thank please you. proceed. Um, since basically since the inception um, of the uh, probation, there were several uh, prerequisites that were a part of the probation, and one of them were three separate uh, courses that I had to take: a uh, professional boundaries course, a uh, medical ethics course, and a uh, breakfast keeping course. And I have completed all of those, and the certificates of the completion are in the folder. Um, I actually learned quite a bit from those courses, especially the prof uh, professional boundaries course. Um, I had to do the psychiatric evaluation within a year of, um, of um, the insertion of the probation, and I, I have completed that, and that's also in there, which did conclude that this was a, a very unfortunate one-time event, and that I'm not a, a threat to anybody, and I'm not... Um, I am able to practice medicine um, safely. Um, I have um, complied with all the quarterly reporting that I had to do, both for myself, as in I'm, I've complied with the law, I have not violated any laws, um, as well as uh, having a practice monitor who is submitting quarterly reports to the board 
saying that my billing and records keeping is has been um, good. Basically, there, there, there are no deficiencies there. Um, that has um, all been completed and is an ongoing process as far as the quarterly reports. I have also, um, with the help of some of the courses that I've taken, uh, but as well as reading a lot on my own, reading books and trying to really delve deep into what happened with me, why did I allow for these um, boundary violations to occur, um, I've been able to identify both my um, limitations, certain things that I had before that I wasn't aware of, um, as well as um, making the necessary changes in my lifestyle, in my life, to make sure that no violation like this happens again, ever. Um, it's part of it is written in my statement. I think you, all the board members, have the statement, but um, I have completely changed my life. I don't work nearly as much. Um, I exercise, I eat well, I practice mindfulness meditation. Um, I take, uh, I, 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 I contribute to my profession. I learn from my colleagues. I have learned to ask for help and ask, um, I have a mentor that works with me. My family life is completely different. I have a, an amazing relationship with my wife and kids. Um, it's just a blessing to be uh, a member of that family. So um, overall, my life is in a completely different place now than it was in 2012. Um, and more than that is my ability to recognize and be mindful of potential violations, potential um, boundary crossings that may end up causing trouble or causing pain to myself or to my patients. Um, it's been a long journey. <laughs> 2012 was uh, an extremely, very, very difficult, maybe the worst year of my life. Um, and at the end, I made a conscious decision that um, I would actually grow from that experience. So I would have to learn and face um, my shortcomings, my failures, and um, and fix them, and, and be a, a great physician, a great father, a great husband, a, a great member of the community. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Nalbanyan. Uh, Mr. Tran, any um, questions on cross-examination? Yes, uh, thank you for appearing here today, Doctor. Um, you stated uh, something to the effect that um, this was an unfortunate, unfortunate incident, a uh, one-time event. Uh, can you just describe for the board members here what that incident was? Yes, um, the incident basically happened over several months, but uh, the, the one-time event common comes from a place where this was one patient. Um, nothing like this had ever happened before or, or since then. Um, but basically, this was a, a, a patient that needed a lot of help. Um, and she came into to my practice. Um, I don't know how much detail we want, but um, basically, as a young physician eager to help patients, um, I was willing and happy to help her. And she she was very grateful about it, and she was vocal about how much um, osteopathic treatments had helped her. Um, and I didn't recognize that her asking me for more time, more treatments, um, you know, going for breakfast or something, all the things that in my normal state I would be raising flags, red flags, that these are boundary violations, and I should say no, and I should make my boundaries and stick with them. Um, because of other circumstances in my life, which I'm, I'm happy to go into um, later, um, I wasn't able to recognize these boundary violations, these potential crossings. And it was a, a slippery slope of me not being aware that I'm starting to cross these boundaries. I'm, I'm, I'm giving in to requests that I should not be giving in to. And unfortunately, over that kind of progressed, and over a period of time, there was a sort of a personal relationship that developed, which um, 
eventually turned into a sexual relationship with a patient. And um, I've been saying that sounds so horrible, and I would never, ever in my life think that I would say it, let alone do it. Um, so eventually, after several months, that relationship obviously failed. It was not something that I wanted to continue participating in. I certainly tried on, on my own to stop, but again, my, my mind was in a really cloudy, dark place at the time. Um, after the relationship terminated, um, basically I was able to start regrouping and rebuilding. I hope that answers the question. Um, from approximately October 2011 to approximately August 2012, you build this patient in approximately 97 visits in the amount of about 30, over $31,000, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, have you paid restitution for any of those? Are you not using the microphone? Have you, have you paid restitution for any of those visits that were deemed medically unnecessary? I wasn't aware that any of the visits were deemed unnecessary. Uh, that was never brought up. That was never an issue. I never got paid that money, actually. That, um, so uh, to answer your question, I have not paid restitution for that. And according to my math calculation, that would be approximately over nine visits per month during that time period. Is that an unusual amount of patient visits for, for a garden variety, for lack of a better word, garden variety patient? Yes, it is. Out of those 97 visits that were um, accounted for that were medically unnecessary, were what percentage of those 97 patient visits were actually for medical services? Well, actually, yeah, I was, uh, at no point was there ever to my knowledge, any of the medical visits can actually concluded that they were medically unnecessary. I think there might have been an allegation like that. Every single time she came in, uh, she got osteopathic treatment, and she certainly had a lot of issues, pains, aches, and, and she got treated every single time, um, which she benefited from every time. And how, why did she need approximately 10, 9.7 visits per month or that year. Well, this was uh, part of the initial problem. Initially, I'll give you an example. The very first time she came in, I treated her, and I said, why don't you come back in a week, and we'll follow up. And that's kind of normal, average, uh, initial uh, approach in osteopathy. And she did. She came back the next week, and she said, you know, felt so much better after the, the treatment. Uh, I would like to come in more. I said, great, let's see you next week. She said, well, can I, you know, it felt really good, can, can I come in two or three times a week? And again, being normally, uh, uh, thinking of it in a rational way, I would say, you know what, that's not necessary. Really, we shouldn't be doing that, just come back next week. Or maybe say, okay, maybe we'll see you one more time this week, but then there's really no need for that, that's just not necessary. Um, and instead, because of my state of mind at the time and my lack of focus and awareness, and with her saying, this was very helpful, I would really like to continue, I'm an eager doctor, I want to help, and there's no actual analysis and thought process that, that raises the red flag, so I, I agree. And that kind of continues. Two to three times a week was a standard uh, visit. But my question is, what were her specific physical complaints that required her to visit you approximately 9.7 times per month during this time period? She, um, to the best of my memory, and I have not reviewed the chart for the, for, um, for the purposes of this hearing, but <clears throat> she had uh, chronic migraines, chronic back pain, low back pain, uh, and neck pain. Um, those were the ones that I remember clearly. There was a period of time where she um, fell and twisted her ankles, so there was a, a personal treatments for that. Um, those were mostly chronic pains. Did you, uh, during these 97 visits, did you ever uh, prescribe her any uh, medication for those pains? I did when she fell and twisted her ankle, yes. How many times did you uh, 
prescribe medications or during this time period? But to the best of my memory, um, and I don't know if there were any antibiotics or anything that I prescribed, and I rarely prescribe antibiotics, but uh, there was one prescription of um, some opiate for that, um, um, the uh, the averted ankle, and I think I gave her 10 pills or something just to get her through the next few days. And the 97 visits were uh, uh, documented in your office. Were there any other visits that were outside of your office that were not included in those 97 patient visits? Not to my memory, no. You said you never got paid for that approximately $31,000 for those 97 patient visits. How much did you get paid, if at all? And I don't, I did not know, um, didn't realize that would be um, brought up, but my best recollection is around $10,000. And in retrospect, you stated something to, I'm not quoting you, something to the fact that uh, some of those were not necessary because of your state of mind or something to that effect. Had I been firmer and truly been in charge of me, you know, deal this work with the patient collaboratively, but I should have limited those visits to once a week at most. And as part of your uh, probation for this incident, <clears throat> you had to uh, uh, undergo a psychiatric examination with a Dr. Ramsey Kiriakos. That's correct. And were you able to read his uh, report? Yes. Uh, and that's also in front of you on yes. uh, tab four, just for the record. You agree with that report? Yeah. I I yes. Okay. Uh, he states, among other things in the report, that um, you know he, during his interviews with you, uh, you felt that she exploited you. She meaning she the patient. You? She exploited you. She meaning the patient. I do you do. Uh, do um, you agree with that um, statement that she, the patient, exploited you? I, I don't know what word I used in the, um, or what word he used in the, um, in the report. I, I do think that uh, the, my inability to set the boundaries were taken advantage of. Taken advantage of, I assume, the patient. By the patient, by the patient. Do okay. you believe that you took advantage of her as well? I think that's unfortunately the end result. Um, it was never ever my intention to, to do that. I, I know that my, uh, let, me, let me clear this. I take full responsibility for what happened. This is not her fault. Whatever she did, She's the patient. I'm the responsible party here. I, I, I was the responsible person from day one. I have taken full responsibility. It was my failure to um, to not treat this patient correctly, um, and I have owned that. Um, so I know that in the end, I have ended up hurting a patient, um, and it's certainly that the end result is that I've taken advantage of the patient. It was never ever my intention to do that whatsoever, or at the time, because of my mindset, I wasn't truly even aware that that's what I was doing. And, and the same psychiatrist also stated in the same report, among other things, that uh, you felt that the patient capitalized on your narcissism. Do you agree with that? I, again, these are interesting word choices by, by the doctor, and then it was a fine doctor. Um, my psychiatrist. Um, I, I, the way I would describe it is, especially initially, it felt really good to be validated as a physician. When she comes in, when a patient comes in and says, hey, you are so helpful, what you did for me was amazing, no one else has ever been able to do that, and, and comments like that, it certainly feeds your ego, especially if there is any kind of an unhealthy presence of ego. And at the time, sadly, uh, I did have that, and yes, it did turn into a, a sort of a narcissistic behavior. Okay. And he also writes, among other things, that you did take full responsibility for what happened, and you know you knew that it was damaging to the patient, to have sexual relations with the patient, 
even even if they they meaning the patient asked for it. Um, then, did you uh, did you uh, that even if they asked for it, did, did that come from you? That I think that came from me. I mean, like this was several years ago. Um, I Jim and I have taken responsibility for it, and um, my state of mind at the time was so cloudy. My, my state of being, my emotional state was so cloudy that um, there is a lot of retro analysis when I'm talking to Dr. Kirakos in 2015 about events in 2012, and and at the time. There, there was really very little awareness of presence of mind of what, what I'm actually doing here. I, I was aware that it was wrong. I was aware of it and I was trying to stop. I actually, on several occasions, I talked to the patient and I said, this has to stop. This cannot keep going on. This is wrong on every level. Um, but again, it's like being stuck in a swamp and not being able to come out of it. So the interview with the psychiatrist uh, occurred uh, in 2015, and the incident occurred, ended, I should say, in approximately 2012, so this is approximately three years after the incident. And you stated to the uh, psychiatrist that she asked for it. This was three years after the incident. So for three years after the incident, you still felt that she had, she had asked for it. She had asked for what? What, what had happened between you two? Yes. Again, that's part of the story, and the other part, the majority part, was me taking responsibility for what had happened. Okay, you stated uh, in your uh, opening statement that you had made changes uh, in your life from 2012 to uh, to the present. Can you describe your life in 2012? How was it in 2012? While this was going on? Yes. Um, I had been working a lot, um, evening hours, sometimes I'd go in on weekends. Um, my personal life, um, and again, I've had a wonderful family, great kids. Uh, they were younger, they weren't sleeping very well, so I wasn't sleeping much, so I, there was this kind of a chronic lack of sleep, um, really low energy um, with me. My wife was an amazing human being. She's an attorney, and she was dealing with two major, major lawsuits. Uh, one of them was going to trial in federal court. Um, so she was really not available, and not that she should have been, um, but she had always been my support system, my emotional support system, so she wasn't present. In fact, I needed to be her emotional support system, and that had pressure um, on me. So, so long hours of work, um, Lack of sleep, Los Angeles traffic, which every day you're driving for hours and it just drives you crazy, um, and and just really not connecting with my wife the way I had been used to beforehand. Um, those were major stressors in my life um, that affected my ability to process and analyze everyday situations. Okay, so in 2012, the, your stressors were basically your your uh, relationship with your wife and the long hours of working, right? Yes. How many hours do you work currently? I uh, limited to 20, 25 hours. Okay, and how, how many hours did you work in 2012? I think it was closer to sometimes 40, 50 hours. And the LA traffic, huh? <laughs> is it still the same? It is worse. <laughs> okay. And how's your relationship with your wife? It, it actually is amazing. I'm a, she's an angel. I'm, I'm a blessed, blessed human being to have her love and support. Uh, she's a very, very wise woman. Um, she's my support system. I am her support system. Uh, she certainly believes in me. We have a wonderful, good uh, communication, uh, which is such an amazing place. Is she here currently? She, she's actually not. She wanted to come. She offered. Uh, she's she's a law professor now. She she was teaching today, and I, I said just don't cancel your class. And she's with me in spirit. What if the board members decided after today that uh, you don't feel on ready for that? <laughs> Information, information, uh, how would you, uh, yeah. I, I 
honor them. I, I respect their choice and their opinion. I would continue with my probation, continue complying with the quarterly reporting, continue practicing with utmost respect for my profession, for my patients. I provide good care to my patients. I will continue doing that and continue living my life, having made the changes I have, which is um, you know, live it to the fullest, be mindful, read lots of books, um, spend time with my family, a lot of time with my family. Do you still see a female patient? Yes. Okay, approximately what percentage? About 60% of my patients. Do you have a, uh, you know, so, you know, so you won't get in trouble again for your for your benefit. Do you have some kind of safeguard, like a chaperone or anything like that? Um, my chaperones um, used to be my medical students when I when I was a preceptor. Unfortunately, because of the probation, um, Western University um, did not have me as a preceptor anymore, so I don't have that. But now I'm um, hoping that if, if the petition is granted, I can start doing that. But the, so the question, so the answer is you do not have a chaperone? Currently, I do not have a chaperone anymore. And then that, not before this incident and not after this incident, has there ever been, has there ever been any kind of complaint? Would you object if that was one of the conditions that they wanted to forget out a chaperone? I will not. I'll open it up to the board for questions. All right. Questions uh, down the line, starting from my left. Dr. Lally. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Nelson, are you aware of the accusation that caused you all this grief that was filed back in, uh, looks like, 14, where under different causes of action and discipline, they say that in the case of the patient, the medical records for the bill base of service do not support either the evaluation of management services or the osteopathic <coughs> manipulation treatment. So that would be contrary to what you had just said. So that's number one. Number two, it appears that once this relationship started, the sexual relationship took place mostly in the uh, large, no, the sexual relationship took place in your office. Were there any outside activities that were done? Um, to answer number one, um, there was there was that accusation, um, and the conclusion, at least my understanding of the conclusion, was that it was actually my poor record keeping. I did not keep good records, which then did not justify the bill. And, and you since learned it was not written, it's not so. That's correct, yes. Um, and uh, the answer to number two is no, this, this was all in the office. And then, I'm sorry, what, what are you doing now? You're, you are seeing patients and you are treating them? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I guess my question is, uh, at what point did you start to feel uncomfortable? With at the uh, situation, oh, early on, <laughs> early on, um, including when the when the question of hey, do you, do you want to go have breakfast on Sunday? Um, in my gut, I felt it, and, and again, it was my limitation, my inability to say no, my lack of thought process that did not listen to my gut, that did not analyze the situation and say no. Um, and, and said, okay. You had said that you felt trapped, like you were in a swamp. Yes. Did, did you realize or think that there could be other options? Unfortunately, looking back at it, um, there were many options, come out clean, Report to the board, tell the patients or the relationship with the patient in a safe way, ask for help, ask for help. Um, at the time, I was in the swamp and I was trying to keep my head above the swamp. And the 
thought was cloudy. Well, there was the desire and several attempts to, to stop. They fell short because I did not put enough effort into it. As you know, uh, physicians are held to a higher standard than anybody else. That's correct. Things happen in offices, things happen in the movie industry, things happen all over. But, but a doctor is looked at as someone who has control, control over a patient. So, I mean, at the very onset of feeling uncomfortable that this person is being too friendly, too suggestive. If you're going to continue to treat them, your only protection is to have someone there who is there as your chaperone. Um, the other, the other question I bring up is: with the, did, the, did you ever refer them to a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, any other specialty to evaluate whether the problem was something you missed in your diagnosis? She current at the time she was under the care of a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and I did try to refer her out to other specialists as well as other osteopaths, and she did not take that referral. Did she? Did you ever order any lab tests, X-rays, MRIs? The X-rays were ordered when she twisted her ankle because I thought there might be a fracture. Um, other than that. I remember quickly there might have been an MRI at some point, and I have not reviewed the chart in a long time. So, in essence, you said that she was not compliant because the referrals you made, she didn't want to do them. Correct. That could have been your way out. Gee, you're not compliant, you're no longer taking my advice. I'm just throwing this out for you because <clears throat> in what we do, we have to protect ourselves as well as protect the patients. And um, I think that this is one of those situations where um, no matter what other things are happening in your life, the responsibilities that we put on ourselves and society and this board expect you to say no, no matter what. <coughs> And if you're going to have any extramarital activities, you keep it out of your practice. That's for sure. Uh, I heard someone lecture one time that said uh, it was had to do with no practice insurance. And they, they asked the question, when is it safe to date an ex-patient? And the lecturer said, from one year to never. And as you experienced, there was litigation involved with that. Quite a so sizable litigation. You know, the question I have, were you being played? I'm not asking you to answer that question, but that's what came up in my mind. Sometimes people get things through roundabout ways, and what you think is happening is you become really naive. You're the best doctor, you're the kindest doctor, you help me more. Things happen, and it costs you financially as well. It almost costs you your marriage. So it, it's such a, I'm not sure you because that was my gut feeling when I started reading the case. I said, how can such a hardworking, smart person get into this? You seem very professional, very well spoken. You don't feel, you don't seem like someone who should have gotten into this situation. So, I, I guess as far as the future goes, when that thought comes into your mind, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. You better listen to it. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, you know, I'm reading over the letter that um, this gentleman submitted to the psychiatrist. And he goes into a lot of depth about your culture and your family um, and how that played into all of this. I'm just curious to know why you felt like all the information was relevant for us to read. Um, and if you 
feel like any of this information might negatively affect you in us making a decision today? Well, the, the psychiatrist evaluation was required. And it's, it's a document that he prepared based on multiple days of examining him. As any psychiatrist would do, he went into all kinds of history with me. Um, so this was not anything I could or even would want to omit from this documentation. Uh, this kind of gives a good summary of my background, certain possibilities of why I need, I, I allowed this to happen. Um, so. Uh, a lot of my history, and I love my family, I love my parents. There's a lot of culture in here, in, in my family. Um, there's a lot of goodness in it. Um, there's a lot of pride in, in keeping people proud and so on that. I am in a really good place with my immediate family, my wife and my two children, as well as my extended family. I am not sure what in here would be harmful to, to me and in your decision. Uh, I'm happy to address any specifics that you have, but I do know that today I am in, in, in a really good place. Well, that's great. Congratulations. Um, just going back to the information here, it says that um, in 2014 when this information came out that you have to submit your psychiatric treatment evaluation within 30 days. And I'm just a little confused if that, if that happened. Can you clarify when the psychiatric evaluation took place after your observation? The psychiatric evaluation started in, I want to say, in October of 2014. The stipulation was that I completed within a year after the beginning of the probation. I was in contact with uh, Corey Sparks during that time as I was trying to find, uh, a psych I was trying to complete the required courses first, so I did that. And then by the time I was able to find somebody that was approved, a psychiatrist that was approved, um, as well as schedule a meeting with him and so on. It, it, it ran in a little over the one year mark that was um, that was required. I informed the board that it was being delayed and I asked for, I basically informed them, I'm doing it, it's just taking longer. Um, the report was much later, February 9th, because the, the psychiatrist basically took at least, if I remember correctly, at least two months to, maybe three months to write the report. But the, the actual evaluation began in the fall of 2014. Can you just briefly tell us what would change if we do, um, you know, allow you to be off probation versus staying on probation for a few years? In my practice, nothing. I, I'm going to, I am going to be an outstanding citizen, physician, husband, father, friend, um, I will be able to teach again, which is one of my other passions, so that will be a really good plus. But, um, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's just mostly for the teaching, but I, I would like to sort of clear the record. I would like to just go back and practice in a good way that I know how to practice medicine. Have you ever disclosed to your staff members or patients that you are currently under probation for what reasons? I have not. I, there was no requirement to do so, and I have not done that. Uh, I, some of my colleagues know, um, but none of my staff members. Um, I have not disclosed it to them. Um, the, this is public information, whether they found out on their own, whether it's um, patients or physicians, um, I don't know. Yeah, but it doesn't make you uncomfortable talking about what has happened and how you're dealing with it with, any, with, with your peers? It, it, it comes up. This is not something I'm proud of, obviously. Um, but the fact that I was able to get through this and come out and learn and work on what, what changes have to be done, um, I actually would want more people to know about this because it blindsided me. I wish more as a student I was exposed to these possibilities. So it's it's not a fun conversation to have, but I'm okay talking about it because that's for me that's part of my healing. Uh, but it's also good for people to to understand that there's a potential for things like these to happen. Thank you. No Thank you.
Um, in the psychiatrist report, he discusses that one of the triggers was at the time um, the relationships with your wife, which you discussed. Correct me if I'm wrong, you stated that that relationship is now excellent. Yes. Um, but the psychiatrist also mentioned that one of the other triggers was the relationship with your mother as well, and I wonder if you can uh, tell the board uh, that if there's any changes made. My mother has always loved me, and I love her for that. Um, part of my work, a little bit with the psychiatrist, but a lot of it on my own, of kind of introspection and, and focusing on trying to figure out what happened was my realization that um, there, there's an element of codependence that I had. And that's probably the simplest way to describe it. And it came from being raised by mostly my mother. Um, I had a loving family. I, I have no complaints about that. She did the best she could. There, there's no intention on her part. Um, but there, there were certain limitations um, and ability to say no and worrying about her well-being over my well-being, not listening to, to my gut, not being comfortable with standing up and speaking up. So, so I discovered that that was the beast, basically, that was kind of lying dormant that came out under <coughs> an imperfect storm of other conditions. And to, to address the second part of your question, um, being aware of that, again, well, my mom and I talk to her frequently, we visit her, they live very close to us, my kids love her, um, but I'm, I've changed my relationship with her after that because I'm able to recognize certain behavior patterns on her part, um, which I don't succumb to. Since uh, being on probation and, and seeing patients, out of curiosity, have you been in a situation where you perhaps have felt the advancement of the patient? And if so, how have you been dealt with that? I have not so far. I will. I would like to keep it that way. Um, if, if, the, if it happens, I will deal with it properly. Um, but I would like to not have to. I would like to just continue practicing and never deal with that. You you mentioned in your testimony earlier that you learned a lot from your professional boundaries class. Yes. I wonder if you can tell the board um, what specifically you learned and what you were you able to take from that. Well, um, it was actually a really interesting class, and they had a really interesting way of putting um, violation potentials. Um, and one of the first things that they talk about is that every single person has a potential for a violation. No one's perfect. I thought it was impossible. Um, so to, the, the key is to recognize your risk factors um, and there, there are risk factors um, as well as um, vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities is basically what I said, something to, to the effect of codependence. Or, um, it, it, it's the ability to recognize all the different factors that could contribute to initially it's boundary drifting, and then it's crossing, and then it's violation. It, it's, it's not always a clear, straight line that's easily visible if you're not really paying attention to it. So it was really helpful to see it put that way, and now you can see the slippery slope. You can see that making one exception, exception here and there could actually lead to more problems. Thank you. Just a couple of clarifications on the timeline. So, the it was it was October 2011 till August 2012 when she was in the practice. April to August is when the um, sort of affair was taking place. And then the board initiated action in April 2014. When was the lawsuit that was arbitrated? The lawsuit was filed around the spring of 2013. Um, and it was settled in, I want to say, June or July of 2014. And then how did it, get, how did it come to the medical board's attention? The, the patient filed the complaint. After the lawsuit, or at the she had filed it. She sorry, she had filed the lawsuit first, and while the lawsuit was going on, she had filed the complaint. 
And then one other area of concern is that in the current practice you're in, there's no safeguard that you've instituted to prevent something like this in the future. And so what what assurances do we have that there may be some some structural uh, systemic or a systematic uh, prevention measures that you've got going on in the office now? Well, the, the safeguard and part of the, the original problem uh, was mostly my my lifestyle and working longer hours and making exceptions as patients on weekends or, or in evenings. That's not happening. So that's a part of the safeguard. Um, I, I'm, I, I enjoyed having students because I love teaching, but also we were the chaperones. Uh, a lot of patients generally would feel uncomfortable with having a complete stranger. When it's a medical student, that's fine, that's one thing, but having a complete stranger just kind of monitoring, it would feel uncomfortable. Now, if that's necessary, then, then, then that has to be done. But um, other than recognizing my own contribution and my state of mind, my awareness, um, limiting my hours of work and my well-being, I, I have not implemented any any other changes. And then and nothing like this is ever happening again, ever. Thank you. All right, Ms. Blair on the phone, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions at this time, thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, you already talked about the documents, did we not, counsel? Yes. Okay, and they're all in evidence? Uh, yes. Okay. And your, you had an opportunity to review the... I don't have any objections. Okay, so all the documents will be in evidence. Um, I think all we have is a closing. If, you, if it, either of you would like to make any kind of closing remarks. I'll wait for the... Okay, doctor. I, I just want to thank the board, thank your honor, for giving me the chance to talk and, and hopefully show you that I have come a long way since 2012 and uh, I would love to be able to teach again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, with that, the matter is submitted. Uh, the record is closed and we are off the record. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to be going into uh, closed session. Just make sure we hang the sign on the door, closed session. For those of you who have ordered lunch, please pick up the lunch and your drinks and enjoy them out to the, uh, up to the outside if it's cleared up or in the waiting area. And uh, we'll contact you when it's uh, back on. Thank you all for being here.